I've chosen on this Lord's Day morning to preach a sermon based on a text that has helped me these last few weeks. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that many, if not all of you here today, will find relevance and application of this text in your own lives. So I want you to go with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. There are quite a number of texts that we're going to go through this morning, but this is our key text, our foundational text for this sermon. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we will begin from verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout care. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. The title of my sermon this morning is Conf Comfort in Affliction. Comfort in Affliction. When considering this text of, uh, or the context of this, of this verse, it would be easy to title my sermon, Why Does It Hurt So Much? That would be an applicable title. To some of you this morning, it, that may be the sermon that you need to hear. Why does it hurt so much? For others, it may be, when will the pain stop? For others, it may be, how long do I have to go through this? Paul, here in writing to the church in Corinth, he writes to encourage them and, and a little bit of of, of history here in 1 Corinthians, he rebukes them from chapter 1 for departing from sound doctrine. And here in 2 Corinthians, he begins by encouraging them. His encouragement comes from his own understanding of affliction and God's comfort in that affliction. He specifically uses the word affliction, which in its original Greek literally means pressure or pressed. So this is about being literally pressed on every side, yet knowing the comfort of God in the midst of that pressing. Beloved, as you begin to listen to my introduction this morning, I want you to fully understand that affliction, trouble, turmoil is an inescapable reality of this world. We've got to come to terms with that. Even though we are redeemed, we live in a fallen world with a fallen humanness. We are all too familiar as we go through the Bible, as we begin to study book by book, as we go from Genesis to Revelation, we are all too familiar with examples of men and women of God who have been afflicted. We consider our beloved Job, and, and he was comforted by some of his friends sometimes who gave him the worst advice but one of his friends speaks with him and he he begins to uh, talk about his troubled life and during his affliction his friend counsels him in Job 5 7 he says a man is born for trouble as sparks fly upwards Job 14 1 we read man who is born of woman is, is, is short-lived and full of turmoil the prophet Jeremiah, also known as the, the weeping prophet, the lamenting prophet, said in Jeremiah 20, 18, Why did I ever come forth from the womb to look on trouble and sorrow so that my days have been spent in shame? Oh, why? Oh, why? 
cries out to God. Even David, who we've come to know, who God calls a man after his own heart, he had moments of despair and sorrow. In Psalm 13, verse 1, he asks God, How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Maybe you two are asking those questions. How long, Lord? How long will you hide your face from me? How long do I have to go through this? When will this pain stop? When will this affliction come to an end? <coughs> In the New Testament, we see that our Apostle Paul was no stranger to affliction. Look at me, if you will, at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23 to 28. We go to us the end of the book. It's chapter 11 and verse 23 to 28. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far great labors, far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me. My anxiety for all the churches. And look at the next chapter, chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 10. He goes on to say, I must, go, I, must, I must go on boasting for there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or not or out of the body I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that, can't, heard things that cannot be told. Which... Man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast. But on my own behalf I will not boast except of my weakness. Though if I should, if I, if I should wish to boast I would, I would not be a fool for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think of me more than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me, to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and carnalities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Beloved, we think that we have it bad. We think the things that we go through in our day, our week, and our month, or our year are bad. But when we think we are pressed on every side that we cannot bear it. But consider Paul here for a moment. As we've just heard, he's physically abused. He's beaten and stoned. He's robbed whilst on the mission road. He's shipwrecked whilst at sea. He's beaten by the Jews and the Gentiles. He's tormented by the false brothers who try to bring his reputation down and destroy the sound doctrine. 
As you go on to read in 2 Corinthians, the only way they could destroy the sound doctrine was to attack Paul, bring him into disrepute. If that wasn't enough, there's the added pressure, the added pressure. So you have all of these things happening to him. He's beaten, he's stoned, he's shipwrecked. He's in danger of robbers, dangers of rivers, all of these calamities. And then he has these brothers in the church who are speaking against him. If that wasn't enough. There's the added pressure of caring for everyone in every church. As a pastor, there is the, the burden of carrying the people's problems. Pastors grieve when the congregation grieves. They pain when the congregation pains. And when the congregation is in sin and in disobedience, the burden is heavy on the pastor. Here, the burden is heavy on Paul. Just to get you to understand, he's beaten physically. He's shipwrecked. Brothers in churches, in, in, in the churches, are speaking against him. And he's carrying the burden of everyone in the church. If that wasn't enough, God allows him to be afflicted even more by giving him a thorn in the flesh. Wow. We thought we had it bad. Beloved, even God's noblest servants, as we have seen, have been inflicted in life and are not immune to suffering. Jonathan Edwards was probably the greatest theologian in America has ever known. For almost 20 years, he pastored faithfully, faithfully pastored the church in Massachusetts for almost 20 years. His preaching had such a great impact on the 18th century that it was a platform for what has become known as the great awakening. And even though he had such a great impact. Even though the world around him. Got to know who Christ was. Through his preaching of the gospel. His church that he pastored for 20 years. Voted him out. They fired him. This was not because of any moral blemish. On his character. Or a deviation from sound doctrine. No they voted him out. They fired him. Because he insisted that only those who made a public confession of faith could join the church and partake of the Lord's Supper. Church, none of us, none of us are immune to affliction. If turmoil and conflict has marked your week, if these months and years have been filled with affliction, a pressing on every side, then you are in good company. For as Job and Jeremiah and David and Paul were helped, so too you and I are helped in our affliction. Our foundational text, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 to 3 says, God comforts us in our affliction. No, it actually doesn't say that. What it does say is that God comforts us in all our affliction. Why don't you go back with me? Just go back with me to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at it again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all, the Father of mercies and, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. Whatever that affliction may be, God comforts us in all our affliction. It doesn't matter how deep, it doesn't matter how deep the the cut this carnal world has inflicted upon you. No matter how far you are from the safety of the shore, being tossed to and fro in the storms of this world, no matter how lonely and isolated you feel, God has promised to comfort you in your affliction. Let it be known today. Let it be known in your understanding. Let it be known in our church. There is comfort in all our affliction. The promise of this comfort is as sure as the promise of the Holy Spirit to the believer. You will remember in John 14, 16, Jesus said, And I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. Do you remember that? The helper here is the Holy Spirit to help, which means to come alongside, to encourage and to exhort. So we are blessed as believers to have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Courage to help. And I'll deviate just a little bit for a few seconds just to, to help in, uh, th 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 those who are engaging with the Jehovah's Witnesses concerning 
the deity of the spirit. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that, um, that, that the Holy Spirit is an active force, is not God. So if you would mark John 14, 16 with me, just go with me very quickly then. Just, let's just uh, look at that and then I can help you. Just, just, just one word, one word will tip the scale on this. One word, just one word. Just give me a few seconds to deviate a little bit here. So John 14, 16, are you there? And I will ask the Father and he will give you another. Underline the word another. Another helper and he will be with you forever. That word another in the Greek is alos, A-L-L-O-S. The word alos in its original meaning means this. In its original Greek means this. Different person, same nature. There is another word called heteros, H-E-T-E-R-O-S. Heteros means different person, different nature. The word specifically used here in John 14, 16 is the word alos. Different person, same nature. So what is God saying here in, in John 14, 16? Ask and I will send the Father who will give you a different person, but same nature as Christ to help you. Are you with me right now? So who, when you begin speaking, when you, when you begin speaking with the, with the Jehovah's Witness and you, begin, and you bring this text up, you start talking about who the Holy Spirit is here then. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, I'm going to give you another. The word in the Greek here is alos. Alos means a different person, same nature. Same nature is who? Same nature is Christ. Okay, let's go back to our, te- our main text. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. There is comfort in all affliction. I hear Paul, I hear Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 as, he, as we talk about the thorn in the flesh. I hear him speaking of a similar comfort. To help Paul, God did not take the problem away, but granted grace and sufficient grace. I want you to pay careful attention to this. This means that God was well aware of Paul's affliction. He was well aware that Paul prayed three times that this problem be taken away. But instead of taking the problem away, or instead of decreasing the problem, God increased the grace. Amen. Comfort to Paul in his affliction was grace and sufficient grace. God gave, God did not take the problem away, God gave Paul the grace to go through the problem, to go through the affliction, to go through the circumstance of life. Am I speaking to somebody here today? I believe I am. As, I've, as this word has spoken to me, even through the course of this week, that there are times, there are times, there isn't enough time this morning to give you further teaching on why God allows affliction and why he sometimes doesn't take it away. There's a reason why God does that. He allows you to be in that situation and that circumstance. He doesn't take it away. Perhaps I will email you this week and give you six points. Just six points on why God allows you to be in that affliction. Why he allows those problems to come your way. And why sometimes he doesn't take it away. Perhaps this week I will do that. I will send you those. I will write those six points out and send them to you. But for now, we have time only to speak a little bit more on grace. And we find that Paul is comforted by the grace of God. Sufficient grace. No matter how big the problem is, grace is sufficient to get us through that problem. To get Paul through that problem. We've often used the word grace. I think this morning through our singing, in our prayers, in our greetings. Even when we come and speak to one another, we say, how are you? We say, by the grace of God, I am well. And we speak about the week ahead. We say, say, by the grace of God, things will be well. We sing of grace, amazing grace. We pray about God's grace. Interestingly, as you begin to look in the the New Testament, grace is mentioned 155 times in the New Testament. It's the Greek word charis. C-H-A-R-I-S. Charis. 
Grace describes God's unmerited favor to mankind. Unmerited favor to mankind that does not deserve it. We deserve the wrath of God. Yet we have the grace of God. So we teach grace is God's unmerited favor. God's unmerited favor. What does it mean? What does unmerited mean here? You've often heard it said, grace is God's unmerited favor. What does it mean? Let's take a few moments, a few seconds to just drop this in. We live in a world that rewards us for our work. The better we do, the greater the reward. All through life, from toddler, from the time your baby's born, to childhood, to teenage years, way into adult life, we see a merit-based system. Do a good job, you get a reward. Do a bad job, you get fired. Apart from Christianity, all religions of the world teach a similar system, a merit-based system. One has to earn enough merit for salvation. One has to earn enough merit to go to heaven. The Boy Scouts would... Uh, the, 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 would, would do certain things to earn their merit badges. Look, I've earned this merit badge and I, I've, I've now been rewarded. I think girl guides are the same. So all the religions of the world, apart from Christianity, teach a merit-based system. A merit-based system. Earn enough merit to go to heaven. Earn enough merit for salvation. But this is not the case in Christianity. In Christianity, we are saved by grace by grace, by grace, by God's unmerited, and we have undeserved favor. Amen. There is nothing that we have done or nothing that we could ever do that could qualify us for the gift of salvation. Nothing, church, nothing. In fact, our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of God. Have you heard that from the Isaiah text? Our righteousness, our works, our efforts are like filthy rags. And when you begin to imagine for a moment filthy rags, you're imagining something that's quite dirty right now. You're imagining something that's soiled. Filthy rags, your righteousness is as filthy rags, correct? Every one of your understandings of what Isaiah means is absolutely incorrect right now. It's far from the truth. Let me show you what our righteousness looks like in the sight of God. When Isaiah speaks about filthy rags, what he's talking about is a rag that is stained with the blood of a woman's menstrual cycle. There is a Hebrew word there when it talks about filthy and rags that speaks about the blood of the menstrual cycle. What God is saying to us through Isaiah is that our righteousness, our works are like a rag, a cloth stained with the blood of a menstrual cycle. Our righteous acts are considered by God as repugnant, as detestable, as offensive, as a soiled Feminine hygiene product. Not of our work. It is by God's grace we have been saved. As Ephesians 2 tells us. Not of our own works. But by God's grace. This grace. This is God's grace that we speak about. And it is an, it is an evident reality in the life of every believer. A reality. I like what one Bible teacher talks about when he speaks about this grace. He talks about grace being a, a dynamic force. It is a, it, is a, it is a power totally transforming believers' lives beginning at salvation. Grace is this divine power poured out into us, working in us to, for our benefit and for the glory of God. This is God working in us. His grace, His divine power in us. And this grace is not only at work in salvation, like you heard me say, it is working in us throughout our Christian life, in our sanctification, and in our service, and in our suffering. As we begin to understand, as we begin to contemplate, not to just contemplate, step out of our comfort zones and begin to preach the gospel, know today that there is a grace for service. Like there was a grace in salvation and a grace in sanctification, there is a grace in serving God. A grace for serving God. God has provided you His divine power 
a blessing, unmerited favor for you to serve him in the preaching of the gospel. So when you step out to preach the gospel, won't you pray, Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. May you grant me grace. Grant me grace that I may be able to serve you in this way to preach the gospel. For I see, as the preacher said on Sunday and through your holy word, that there is a grace for the preaching of the gospel. May that grace work through me. We find that there is enough grace. There is enough grace for salvation. There is enough grace for sanctification. There is enough grace, enough grace for service unto God and, and their church. There is enough grace to see us through our suffering. If we took this into part two, we would begin to see how that grace works through us, through the power of the Holy Spirit. As I mentioned to you earlier on, grace is mentioned about 155 times in the New Testament. And in every place it is mentioned in the context, there is such richness. There is such a fullness when the word grace is used. So let's go on a little journey together. Let's start in Ephesians. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2. And in order for me to give you uh, the points I need to read in context, so we have to put a bit of a ch chunk of, uh, of Scripture in context for you to better understand what the writer is saying. Ephesians chapter 2, let's look at verse 1. And here is the, the message of our salvation. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 8. You there? And you were dead in the trespass you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, but God rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places so that in the coming ages he might show us look at these words the immeasurable riches of his grace not just grace but the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Amen. Paul is saying to us, yeah, listen, you belong to the world. You belong to the devil. You belong to the flesh. Those things held you captive. But God, rich in mercy, by grace you have been saved. Not of your own works. You have not delivered yourself from the world, your flesh, and the devil. But God has delivered you. And he speaks of this grace and he speaks of it not just as grace but the immeasurable riches of his grace. Go to chapter 1. Read from verse 3 to verse 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his, look at the words here, glorious grace. Wow, not just grace but glorious grace. With which he has blessed us in the beloved. He's blessed us with this glorious grace. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses. According to, here's another one. The riches of his grace. Amen. Which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight. And the word lavish there means to, be, to heap upon you. To pour out. To load upon you. Here is this grace, this glorious grace, the riches of his grace leaped upon us, lavished upon us, poured upon us, loaded upon us. Wow. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and we'll look at verse 14.
So verse 14 of chapter 4 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Wow, here is a throne of grace the throne of grace can you imagine that for a moment imagine a throne and here is the throne that is full of grace and God calls us to that throne and we come boldly and confidently not because we deserve it but because Christ has secured and justified us to be there through his atoning sacrifice look at Romans 5 with me Romans 5, verse 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with, our, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It's the grace in which we stand. Go further and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Verse 6 says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work as it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He is able to make all all grace, not just grace, but all grace. Can you see how the writers are describing grace? Glorious grace, all grace, throne of grace, immeasurable riches of grace. Proceed further down to verse 10. He will supply seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way through which through us will produce thanksgiving to God for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of the service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the, here's another one, the surpassing grace of God upon you the surpassing grace not just the the grace the surpassing grace and that word surpassing means outstanding exceptional here is the, the, the and all this is happening while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing the outstanding the exceptional grace that is upon you wow Consider for a moment, let's go a little to the left, look at John 1, go to John 1, look at verse 14 very quickly. John 1 verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen of his glory, glory as the, as the, as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth here Christ is presented full of grace Christ here is the the word that became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory the glory as the only son from the father full of grace this is Christ full of grace and truth 
John bore witness about him. Let's, look, let's read, read a little further. This was he of whom I said, he comes after me, ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. Ah, if we thought that grace was enough for us to bless God with we hear through John, those of us who are in Christ have not just grace, but grace upon grace. And you said you have nothing to be thankful for. You said you have nothing to glorify God for. And you think there's nothing for you to sing about and pray about and offer thanks for. Here we see that in Christ, he's full of grace. And here John like I said, speaks of Jesus. He says Jesus is full of grace. And then verse 16 tells us uh, that of this we have, of his fullness we have received. Of the fullness of Christ, believers have received. What does it mean? We love because we are in Christ and we know the fullness of love in Christ. We have peace because we are in Christ and Christ is peace and we have the fullness of peace because we are in Christ. There is a grace that abounds to us. The fullness of grace. Because we are in Christ. And we have the fullness of Christ. In us. In Acts chapter 4. Let's read very quickly. The, one of the last um, portions of scripture I want to give you. Concerning how grace is written off in the New Testament. All these adjectives that are added on to the word grace. Acts chapter 4 can, verse 32 to 37, considering the, the early church and how it grew. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon the apostles was upon the preachers, was upon the pulpit only, was upon the elders only. No, great grace was upon them all. The apostles and those he led, there was great, not just grace, here's a great grace upon them. We see in just a few of our texts, that is not just grace, but Great grace, full of grace, surpassing grace, all grace, glorious grace, immeasurable riches of grace, grace lavished upon us, grace upon grace. Folks, this is how God comforts us in our affliction. He comforts us with lavish grace, with immeasurable riches of grace, with surpassing, outstanding, exceptional grace. This is his divine power in us to strengthen us in our affliction and our weakness. This is what Paul means when he says, God has told me that my grace is sufficient. It is enough. The word sufficient is important. It's a present tense word. It literally means, or it applies to, or it's applicable as in right now. Present tense word. My grace is sufficient. So in the middle of your present trial, in the middle of your present affliction, you are afflicted now. You're in trouble now. And for your now affliction and your now trial and your now trouble, there is a now grace, a now help. Sufficient grace for you right now. That is why Paul could say, for when I am weak, then I am strong. There's a weakness and a strength at the same time. May that be our confession as we come to terms with God's most amazing grace. May grace not just be something we sing about, but a reality in our lives. May we be a people, a people, a church of God that know the grace of God. May we be a testimony of people living in this fallen world saved by grace, but also living by grace. Serving the Lord by grace. And powering through those afflictions by the grace of God. But that's not where I want to end here. 
That's not my conclusion today. It's not where I want to end. I want to go back to our text. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to verse 7. And in five minutes, I will close. Second Corinthians 1 verse 3 to verse 7 we'll read again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. And then we get to this part that brings me to the conclusion that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Uh -huh. we, can, we can conclude... That in times of affliction, the person who comforts us is God. For it says that God is the God of all comforts, correct? We can conclude that the comfort is a promise from God to his people. For it says in the text, who comforts us in all our, all our affliction, correct? Then we get to the last part, which is the purpose of the comfort. And here's the valuable lesson to which, on which I close today. According to our text, the purpose of the comfort does not end with us being comforted, and that's it. God's comfort to us, oh, and he, he, he comforts us because He loves us and He cares for us, but He has ordained that the comfort we receive from Him should be able to help others to comfort others as well. I see it as a... I see this, this comfort that God has comforted me with even these last few weeks as a treasure entrusted to me. And I can dig a hole and bury it. Or I can hide it in a corner. Or I can use it. But not to hide this treasure, this comfort that God gives us. We may comfort others, as Paul says. As you have been comforted by God, so you are to comfort others in their affliction. I have, I have, just, I have one more text, but I'll read it out to you. Luke 22, verse 31 to 32 makes, makes my point concerning this. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus allowed, Jesus could have very easily stopped it. Jesus could have prevented it from happening, but he didn't. He didn't. He prayed for him that his faith may not fail fail and when you have turned strengthen your brothers in other words this experience that you're going through where God is helping you in your time of trouble where you're being comforted and strengthened will be something that will be used by me by God in the strengthening of your brothers so I submit to you today that your affliction is used by God to show you the grace of God your affliction is used by God to show you that in your weakness you are made strong. Your affliction is showing you that you need to depend on God, that His rich grace, His abundant grace, His overflowing grace, His lavish grace, His immeasurable grace, His glorious grace. His sufficient grace. It's the portion of every believer. You also know today, that as God comforts you through your affliction, so, you, so too you are to comfort others in their affliction. What will you take from this today? How will you respond to this today? Why don't you close your eyes for a few moments and just think about that before we close today. How would you, what would you take from this? How would you respond to this? For me, I would say the first thing I would be was to give thanks for God's amazing grace. Grace in salvation that is not of my own works that God saved me, but by grace I have been saved. I'm so thankful for that amazing grace. I'm thankful this morning as I hear the preacher, as I hear the word, as I hear the various texts 
That grace has not stopped at salvation, but grace continues in my life. That there is grace for me today in my sanctification as I progress towards glorification. There's a grace for that and I see there is a grace in my service. In the things that God has called me to do, there is a grace in that service, for that service. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm also thankful that there is a grace sufficient overflowing, lavished in the midst of my suffering, whatever that affliction is, past or present, right now, this moment, there is a grace, immeasurable, glorious, grace upon grace, the fullness of grace. There is grace for me today. God comforts me through this affliction. What will I take from this today? I will take from this today. That what God has blessed me with, I need to bless others with. In the way God has comforted me, I need to comfort others. Father God, I pray.